Hi. Today I'm going to tell you a story. This is going to be quite different to most of the YouTube videos that I've done before. So if you are looking for, for a video that's going to be really clear and to the point with a beginning, a middle and an end <laughs> and three action items, this is not the video for you. <laughs> this is a personal story about what my process was like to go from being unhappily single to being with a partner who adores me and the role that human design played in that and some of the um, <laughs> mishaps along the way. Um, this is a story that I have not told publicly um, on camera uh, or, or live out of my mouth ever before. So bear with me while I meander through a very personal story um, that I hope is going to have a lot of value for you. If you are somebody who is at all new to human design, uh, a week a week ago you found a chart or a, a month ago, a year ago, or even several years ago, but you are still struggling to find a partner, to have a happy, healthy love life, um, or you're really struggling to know like, is it that important? Like, do I really have to follow my design? You're maybe still sceptical, which, by the way, is totally is totally normal and it's totally fine. A lot of us have scepticism built into our chart and a lot of us have had past experiences that say maybe I won't have what I want in future. So this video is designed to be part uh, inspiration and hope that it can get better um, and also part instructive through a story um, and as I as I share the story I will attempt to like pull out the pieces of teaching the lessons um, so that you can see how it applies to you directly although even my story itself is probably going to be quite instructive so for context if you're brand new to me hi I'm Carolyn Southwell. Um, I first met my human design chart in March 2014. So I have been playing with this system for a long time, nearing on nine years at this point. And I am a 2-4 emotional projector. I have, for those of you who know more about human design, the head and Ajna defined and also the solar plexus and the root center defined. And that is it. So an important part to note in here is that with an undefined heart centre, also known as will centre or ego centre, which many of you will have, this played a really important role in why I was struggling for so long to find a partner who would love me. <laughs> and also, uh, it, so it's going to be really relevant for you if you are somebody who is a projector, somebody who is wanting to know, does it really matter if I follow my strategy, if I want to like you know, uh, like bring my love into my life, my life partner. Um, and if you are somebody who has an undefined heart, will, ego center, the little tiny triangle near the middle of the chart, if it's white, then this is for you as well. So let me backtrack. When I was a child and a teenager, I had a really rubbish sense of self-worth. I was teased a lot at school. I thought I considered myself the ugly duckling. Um, and I, I really, I didn't feel like I was ever going to have a boyfriend. I, I, I am um, cisgendered, heterosexual. I wanted a boyfriend. Um, and I, that wasn't going very well. <laughs> I felt uh, ignored, which is common as projectors, um, and I, I really didn't get a lot of attention. I can tell you, when I turned 18, halfway through year 12, and I could go out partying and drinking, I made up for lost time, and I got myself into all sorts of um, less than ideal situations, mostly where I was not valuing myself, and this will be, this is common for for a lot of people um, where we really want to be loved and we will do things, we will betray our own body in order to get love. So I had lots of sex with lots of people um, and often it was not very loving or respectful. 
there were a lot of people who wanted my attention and wanted my body, but didn't necessarily recognize and love me as the projector, me as Carolyn. And some version of that continued the whole way through university, the whole way through my 20s. Um, unfortunately, in that process of not valuing myself, I was sexually assaulted multiple times. If this is something that has happened to you, I hear you. It is not, it's not pleasant. It's not fun at all. And it's it's things that I've done a lot of tapping on. I've done a lot of different therapeutic processes on, which is why I can talk about it without shutting down or freezing or crying. <laughs> it's not ideal. And it's it's not a wonderful way to treat the body at all. Um, to in my case, I had put myself in situations where I I couldn't say no. It didn't feel safe to say no. Um, and and I want to just pause for a minute and realize like if that is something that has happened to you in whatever way contextually that may have happened, um, there is a there is a process that we can go through of healing what was done to us and come out the other side of it genuinely happier, healthier, stronger and more in touch with our, uh, like a respect for our body um, and, and a power to be able to say no to things that don't truly honour the value and the preciousness of who we are. So, mouthful of water. I spent a lot of time, and any of you split definition people will will appreciate this. You single definition people, if you know what that term means, you know, you can enjoy other people's company, but it's not the same sense of like needing and wanting a partner. But all of us who have centres, we have definition in two different, two or more, two, three, four different chunks that are separate from each other. We're always looking for someone to connect us, right? When we think about this idea of you complete me, (laughs) there's a good chance that electromagnetically they do, right? So that's, I didn't even realise it, but that's what I was looking for. I wasn't just looking for somebody to love me. I was also looking for somebody to energetically, electromagnetically complete me. And that will be relevant for, it may be relevant for you as well. So back to my story. Every time I was assaulted, and I have a lot of correction in my chart, I look at things and I go, what did I do wrong and how do I fix it? (laughs) Right? That's my design. Shout out to all of you who have Gate 18 defined. Each time that happened, and there was, you know, several years in between each of them, and they were all slightly different, but they had similar similar situations in that all of them were date rape-ish, right? So all of them were, um, none of them were unexpected shocks out of nowhere. All of them were situations that had slid in a direction that I definitely didn't want and then didn't know how to get out of. Um, and each time my very clever mind went, oh, how do I do that differently next time? What do I have to do differently so that that doesn't happen again? (laughs) And the mind can only take us so far. As I discovered when I was in my early 30s and the same thing happened again and I was like, what the actual fuck? (laughs) By this stage, I already knew so much about the spiritual world the metaphysics, the role that I play in things. I'd read all the manifestation books. I had read The Secret, blah, 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 all the things, right? And I'm like, I'm playing a role in this. What am I doing? What is happening here? And I want to just pause for a second and say, if you are somebody who's watching this and you feel very triggered by me saying, you know, this role that I played, And it feels very much like, hang on, hang on, hang on. This other person did this thing to me. Yes, this other person did this atrocious thing to you. Um, And the bit that I was looking at is like, what's, what's the bit that's in my control? What's the bit I can change? Yeah, that guy was a fuckstick. (laughs) I don't want that to happen to anybody. I didn't want it to happen to me. But I was looking at like, where's my bit? Even if it's a tiny bit, what's my tiny bit 
that led me to be in a circumstance where I could even be in a situation where I could expose my body to not being cared for and nourished and cherished. How did I get to that situation? So after the last time that happened, I did. I had a big chunk of time being celibate again. <laughs> it's like no sex with other humans. No, no, no. I've got to unravel these patterns. And I had already, by the time this had happened, the last time it was 2017. And it was at a period of time where I had been traveling extensively through Australia. And I had been house sitting a lot. And I was traveling to visit different people. And for context, my family lives in Sydney. So I'd go away on adventures and then I'd come back to see them. And I'd go away on adventures again and come back and see them. And at this point in time in October 2017, I was traveling, or mid-2017, I was traveling through Brisbane. And I had this really strong um, sense. My body knew. My body was like, you're going to live here. I'm going to live here. We are going to live here. This is going to be home. And by that stage, I'd already been playing with human design for more than three years. So I knew and I had been teaching clients all about the importance of waiting for the invitation. And there's this funny thing that can happen when we're really becoming more and more embodied in like understanding like, oh, well, what is an invitation really? Like, oh, well, I've had this intuitive sense, you know, and the same can happen for generators and manifesting generators of like, oh, yeah, but my intuition is saying such and such and it's so strong. I knew I was moving to Brisbane. It was like I had no logical reason whatsoever, zero for why I would move there, but I knew. It was so clear in my body. And the trap we can fall into as we're navigating this is to go, oh, well, my intuition said blah, 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 so I can just steam on right ahead. Uh, That's a trap. Please don't do that. Here's what happened when I did that. Very soon after, through a friend of a dear friend, I... I met a man who I had a really like profound chemistry with. Now, if you know anything about the electromagnetics of the gate, like let's just jump out for a second and say, if you know a lot about human design, then, or even if you look at your chart, you might see that there are, you'll have a whole bunch of hanging gates. Everyone has hanging gates where you've got a gate. It only goes halfway. So it's defined, it's colored halfway. That half is always looking for its other half. So when you meet somebody like I did with this man, uh, where you have one half and they have the other half, and that happens two or three or four or five or six times in a chart, the more times it happens, the stronger the chemistry is. So my chemistry with this guy was off the charts. He lived in Brisbane. So very, very quickly, I had jumped to the conclusion that oh, well, I'm going to move to Brisbane and I have this great chemistry with this guy and he's really into me and I'm really into him. Maybe this is the relationship that's going to move me to Brisbane. So after I had finished that particular trip and gone back to Sydney, we'd stayed in contact. A couple of months later, I went back up to Brisbane to spend time with him. And it very, very quickly became apparent this is not a safe relationship to be in. He was violent. It was scary. It was the um, the the most vivid example I'd ever had of what it would feel like to be in a domestic violence relationship. Despite all the sexual assaults that had all been more like one-off, you know, people coming into my life and then disappearing again, this was somebody who I was trying to have a meaningful relationship with and I was like, this person is scary, like ongoingly scary. I do not feel safe in this house. How the fuck did I end up in this in this mess, in this relationship? And so as I, I tried to disengage myself from this person, 
I really had to take some time. And it coincided, unfortunately, within in a couple of weeks of being assaulted by somebody else. There are so, so many stories here. I probably at some point need to write a book um, because you're getting the like the, the tumbled out version. So if you're still with me, thank you. Um, I'm going to get to the beautiful point of how I am standing in my home in Brisbane <laughs> talking to you as I stand at my stand-up desk that was built by my partner who adores me. So let's go back to October 2017. And within two weeks of each other, these two really awful things happened that clearly were designed to wake me up. Did they both have gate 51 defined? Probably. They were probably here to shock the shit out of me and wake me up. I disengaged, detangled myself as quickly as I could from both of, from contact whatsoever with both of those men where these things had happened in, in two different states, both within two weeks of each other. And I went into this period of being celibate and really going, okay, everything that I've tried to do to peel back these patterns of things that have happened in the past haven't worked all of the journaling and the mantras and the affirmations and the way I had done tapping in the past and um, in a not very trauma informed bypassy kind of way um, all of the the breath work all of the um yeah rah-rah personal development kind of ways of doing things it hadn't worked all of the relationships advice I'd been given it hadn't worked so I knew I had to do something different and there was something really profound that I did in that period of time while I was healing and one of the things that I did was instead of looking for like what's my ideal that I wanted and I had that really clear vision. Let's let's just pause on that for a second because I did have a really clear vision of what I wanted. We have to be really clear about what we want. So I had a clear vision of like what I wanted the relationship to feel like. And I put down this thing of Brisbane. I'd basically at that point basically forgotten about it because what I had lived through in that couple of week period was so traumatic that I didn't even have space to remember that my body knew it was moving to Brisbane. I was just like, how the actual fuck do I unravel this this pattern that is living in my body, in my mind? How do I how do I unravel this? I knew that it must be possible. If I could see other people who were in loving relationship, I'm like, if they can have that, it must be like some logical part of me was like, that must be possible somehow. I'm a good person. I want a partner. This must be possible. So I had a, a basically a dot point list of my vision of what I wanted in a relationship and I knew my make or breaks. I knew I wanted somebody who like valued health and I knew how I wanted to be treated. I knew that I wanted to feel loved and cherished. And as often as I could bring myself to, I would anchor into and imagine that vision. But I didn't do it a lot, just whenever it, you know, spontaneously occurred to me or it felt within reach. And the other thing that I did that was a game changer was I started um, upping the minimum um, that I would say no to. I started bringing my my bottom bar um of what what I was willing to tolerate I improved the quality of my no that is when somebody would treat me the way I didn't want to be treated if somebody would approach me as a romantic partner and I felt ick in my body or uh, the way that they were talking to me or the way they were looking at me didn't feel good to me if in the past I would have put up with that I didn't put up with that anymore. And I started practicing saying no, whether it was out loud to them, if it felt safe to, or in whatever way I had to do it. Sometimes I had to get creative 
or I would say it silently within myself of like, no, that, nope, we're not doing that again. That's not okay with us, right? Us being <laughs> all the various versions of me that live in my head, right? So I started upping my no. And what was really interesting, and this is a really, really valuable lesson for the undefined heart center. Remember that tiny triangle, heart, will, ego. Tiny triangle, if it's white in your chart, this very much applies to you. But if it's useful, if you have a defined heart center, you can also use it. It's like I just I just started actively practicing saying no. And if it felt scary, like if it didn't say safe to say, to say no to somebody directly, then I would disengage myself however I had to. And then I would either not talk to them. If they're not safe, I don't have to talk to them. Or I would find a different way to say no from a distance. Yeah. So I started upping my no. And what I noticed is that the people who respected me, valued me, would accept my no. They didn't have to like it, but they would accept it. The people who had a hissy fit and a tantrum and carried on and made me feel bad and blocked me and blah, blah, blah. Well, they never valued me in the first place. So why the hell would they get access to, to me and my body and my the vulnerable parts of me, right? So very important. I upped, I, I want to find a really clean way to say this, but I haven't, I haven't worked it out yet. But I hope it makes sense. Like I I started improving the quality of my no. I said, because I remember reading something that said, you know, you're you're not going to create in your life the ideal thing that you say yes to. You're going to create what you're willing to tolerate. So I started tolerating less crap. Maybe that's a better way to say it. I started tolerating less bad behavior. I, I stopped tolerating people I wouldn't be in relationship of any description with somebody who wasn't wasn't treating me the way I wanted to be treated. So I did that. And I did versions of tapping, which I, I now do professionally with clients. Versions of tapping that became more and more and more trauma-informed over time as I learned more and more from really great teachers. So I did that work with myself. Um, and with great practitioners when I could find them. Um, and I really practiced noticing when there were true invitations. Like I got really clear about the importance of understanding the nuances of following my human design strategy. Now, in this process, And that process took more than a year of shifting from being assaulted, being yelled at and being terrified um, in these two different situations to then getting an invitation out of the blue from a friend of mine who valued me, who asked me whether or not I wanted to come up to Brisbane to house sit and look after her dog. She valued me. She went, okay, well, look, I realise it's a really short period of time. I'm happy to pay for some of your costs to get up here if you want to you want to come up. So that felt like a true invitation. I felt valued. So I said yes. I was happy to do that because it meant that I got to do some exploring in Brisbane. I still was not thinking about my body had having this knowing more than a year earlier I'm going to move to Brisbane. All I knew is like, oh, there's park runs there and I can go do some new park runs and that's exciting. If you don't know what park run is, it's just a running thing every Saturday morning. Um, a thing I've been collecting for a few years. So that felt fun. So I just, I had invitations and then in between I was going and doing the things that felt joyful. So like walking this dog, which was joyful and going to park run, which was joyful and exploring a new city that I haven't spent that much time in. Lo and behold, I go to park run and a man calls out to me. He notices that I'm running barefoot. That's another whole story for another time. Um, and I can tell from the way that he has like called out to me that he's being fun and playful and wants to engage. So I engage with him. I don't for one moment think, oh, this is the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, right? I just realize that here is a person who wants to hang out with me, who I enjoy enjoying spending time with. Now, that was the 1st of January, 2019. 
in the within two weeks, I shoot you not, within two weeks, I said yes to being his girlfriend. He had invited me to be his partner and I had said yes and it felt really true. And what had happened in that period of time is every time I had wanted to, ha- he had wanted to hang out with me, he had invited me again and again and again and it felt good. So I said yes, it felt good and I said yes. And then when he got, and this was important, when he tried to get close to me, physically close to me, faster than I was ready, I said no. And he respected that. So I had done enough therapeutic work within myself over that year or more, 14 plus months, to then be able to go, okay, I value me enough that I can say no to this person who wants my attention. And he took it really damn well. And then he invited me out again (laughs) just to hang out, just to go for a run, just to spend time with me before I went back to Sydney. And then it became very obvious to me of like, oh, this is a man who treats me really, really differently. And I had to do some more processes, (laughs) some more shifting out the old stuff of like, wow, maybe I'm allowed to have a partner who treats me really well. It still felt really weird. But I went through a process and I shifted more stuff energetically out of my body, (laughs) more tapping and energetic processes. And, And then I was able to say yes to him. And then he wanted to come to Sydney and see me. So again, he was giving my en- giving me energy to play with. He was giving me his time and attention in a way that was really respectful and it felt like a yes for me. And so he just, he kept inviting me to do things. He kept inviting me to hang out. He kept inviting me to, to, to do things. And it was really respectful of my nose. Within three months, like three months and five days or something, I had said yes to his invitation to move up here to Brisbane. I am in my office, in his house, in our house, in Brisbane. My body knew I was moving to Brisbane. But for me to get here, for me to get here to be in this, or now I might cry (laughs) because I'm so grateful. For me to be here in this house in Brisbane that my body knew it knew that I was that I was supposed to be here. There was no logical way that I could have known. There was no there was no shortcut to get here trying to just follow my intuition and take action because that's not correct for my design. It is correct for a really small number of other people's design, right? And that's how human design is beautiful. It gives us a roadmap to understand, oh, as long as you have the correct time, date and location, you have this guide, this map, this map that can be used to guide your life so that you understand why with an undefined heart center you might find it hard to value yourself and you might find it hard to say no to people. And it gives you a clue as to where you need to to clean stuff up, to clean up old behaviours, to be able to get the, the, the love relationships that you want in your life, any relationships, the things that you want in your life, the stand-up desk, <laughs> the beautiful webcam so that you can see my face as I tell you this vulnerable story. Um, and... And I had to pair human design with trauma-informed tapping so that I could get more and more connected to my body and safely move some of these horrendous experiences out of my body. So then I didn't have that running. I didn't have these old destructive patterns running the way I did relationships. So there's hope. If you have watched this and you are in anything other and there's a good chance that if you are watching this, you're in something other than a beautifully loving, respectful relationship. I want to tell you that it is absolutely effing possible for you to go from any version of ugly duckling with low self self esteem who goes through multiple experiences of really un 
loving, unhealthy sexual interactions where you feel really unsafe and unseen to then being in a loving relationship with another human. And I don't care what this is true, regardless of your sex, your gender, your sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. Your human design chart can guide you and then you can pair it with a way. (laughs) I use trauma-informed tapping, but you can pair it with a way that works for you. And this is possible. Now, if you like how I roll, you can, of course, do that work with me. I can help you to understand your human design chart better. I can help you move through this mess um, towards something that you love more, that you would love in your life, um, and help you to do some trauma-informed tapping and understand how to do that with yourself if you like. And if all you got, and and I will put links for anything that's useful below this video. Um, but the main point of this story is for you to be able to see, babe, it's possible. It's possible for you to have a really um, loving, intimate relationship with another human being. And human design is probably going to play an incredibly important part in that. And for learning how to follow our strategy and inner authority can be literally life-changing and life-saving. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.